the stories with faith and I believe that you're still restoring, redeeming everything here in this moment. But you will be done in me. What'd you say? Cause I will run like a child to the mother to save the other father. To the place where I belong And Lord, your love Could I ever understand it? There's something about your presence That leaves me RCOG, thanks for choosing us this Sunday. Here's what's going on this week at RCOG. We'll have a Revive Wednesday this Wednesday night at 7 p.m. in the Worship Center. We have a great worship set planned, and we'll also be hearing a message from guest speaker Kenny Grant. All classes will be canceled this night, but nursery will be provided. Make plans to be a part of this great night of worship and the Word. There will also be a youth movement fundraiser meal before the service, beginning at 6 p.m., Register online via the app or the events page. Kid City's current series is called Glow in the Dark, where we're shining a light on all things Easter. This week, we're talking about Jesus in the temple and learning we can shine God's light. Kid City is available during the 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. services. The growth track happens every Sunday in the Family Life Center during the 9 a.m. service. With the growth track, you can become a member, discover your gifting, and see how you can make a difference here at RCOG. To register, visit rcog.tv forward slash grow. We'll be having First Monday Prayer tomorrow evening at 6.30 in the Worship Center. Join us as we pray together for the needs and the lives of our church family and community. We'll be hosting a water baptism on Sunday, March 17th. If you or someone in your family would like to make a public declaration of your faith, register online or on the app. Palm Sunday Fun Day is happening on March 24th at 10 a.m. in the Five Acres. 
Join us for an outdoor worship service, barbecue lunch, inflatables, and an egg hunt. Registration opens at 9 a.m. The egg hunt begins at noon. Bring your outdoor chairs and get ready for a great time of connection. RCOG is hiring. We're currently looking for two preschool leads and two special needs assistants. Apply online at rcog.tv forward slash jobs or on the app. Thank you for your continued generosity, RCOG. For your convenience, we have multiple ways that you can partner with us today. You can give online at rcog.tv forward slash give, on campus at the giving station in the lobby, or directly on our app. Are you a first-time guest or are you looking for a home church? We can't wait to get to know you a little better. Fill out our connect card at rcog.tv forward slash new or look to a seat near you to pick up a paper copy. Turn it into a volunteer and receive your free gift bag from the Worship Center lobby right after service is over. See a volunteer for questions or assistance. Just in case you missed the announcements or if you're looking for additional information, check out our website events page or download our app. All the information you need is located in one easy to find place. Thanks again for choosing RCOG this morning. Enjoy the rest of the service. Good morning, RCOG. Let's stand and praise the Lord today. How many of you are free this morning? Free from yourselves, free from your past, and have freedom reign in this place today.
thinking when I was just in that song, the word of the Lord just came to me that the spirit of the Lord is here. And I praise the Lord. Can we just give God some praise in this house? For he has met you here for a specific reason. You're not here by, by happenstance or, or nothing. He has, gave, he has brought you here for a reason, for a divine appointment. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're here for a divine appointment. Amen. Welcome home. Welcome to Reekin Church of God. We thank God that you're here. And we just hope, hope that you feel at home. And if this is your first time, that you'll make this our church, your home. Because we are our family here. And uh, we just, we love everybody. We got a great church here and we just want to encourage you. If this is your first time, please fill out a connect card and and meet somebody at the welcome booth in the back and somebody be there waiting for you. So uh, let's just worship the Lord. Amen. Let's pray. God, we love you. Lord, we love you with all of our heart. And we thank you, Father God, for the freedom that we feel in this place this morning to come and worship you. God, to come and give you praise, give you glory, give you all of the things, Lord Jesus, God, that you so deserve. Father, we pray, God, that at this time, Lord God, that you will just permeate our hearts and our minds. And God, that we will focus on you this morning, Lord God. Father, I pray, God, that as we come into this place today, Lord, that we will leave any troubles or fears or things behind and that we'll walk in freedom today. Father, we love you and we thank you for this time. Touch and bless, Lord God, the remainder of this service, Lord Jesus. God, as I know you will, open our hearts, Lord God, and our minds, our ears to receive your word, our hearts, Lord God, to to, to receive it and take it and apply it. We love you, Father, and we thank you for this time. We worship you in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope with no place to begin Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested my life began Sing, Ash was redeemed. In Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains. In my orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested. My life began. Come on, sing this together. I know you know it. Oh, your grace so free washes over.
darkness rejoices though heaven had lost what can Jesus arose without
this room if you're not already the natural sign of availability in worship is hands lifted we lift our hands sometimes in worship and praise and we lift our hands to say God we're available we lift our hands in surrender to say Lord we take our hands off of the control of our lives and our situation and God we surrender that over to you right now right now as your hands are lifted and you're talking to him whatever it is that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you right now if you need to surrender your will if it's your marriage if it's your health your finances if it's doubt or fear that you're experiencing because of something you're walking through right now if it's just the uncertainty of the season that you're in we just say to him Lord right now I surrender all this to you just take it take it Lord take the worries and the cares Peter said we can cast all our cares on him because he cares for us Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and lay your burdens on me, and I will give you rest. Lord, we surrender it all to you today. It's in our emptiness, Lord, that you fill us up. It's when we say that we're available, and it's not about us anymore, that you do your best work. It's when we get off the throne of our hearts and our lives and we set you in that rightful place as Lord and King over all that you do your best work. So today, those things that we may have come into the house with that we're trying to hang on to and we're trying to control and we're trying to navigate our own situation, God, let us release those things. Release that in the name of Jesus. Release that over to Him. Give him that worry. Give him that fear. Give him those cares right now. Surrender to him right now that thing that's just weighing you down as you came in today. He sees it. He knows it. He's good. He's merciful. He's present in your situation despite your circumstance. He is there. He is faithful. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Here I am. Say it one more time. Here I am. You can have it all. You can have it all. Oh, here I am. Here I am. You can have it all. We're going to sing that one more time. I want you to flip in your brain what you're singing. Put that lyric back up again. Here I am. Instead of thinking, here I am, the names of our God are framed in the work of the Old Testament in the two words of I am. All right? So you, you sing it like this. Here I am. Oh, you see what I'm saying? Here I am. You can have it all. I am. You can have it all. I am. Jesus said, you know why we can say that? Because Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I am the door. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the bread of life. I am the water of life. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the beginning and the end. I am. Oh, come on. Let's give it to I am here today. Yeah. Here I am. Come on.
us that last verse. For the one who gave me life. Mm, come on, somebody. Nothing is a sacrifice. So use me how you want to, God. I'm here. Yep. Have your throne within. Take it back. Say it again, verse 3. Come on, take it back. Come on, church. The least that we can do is surrender it all to Him. Lord, use us, Lord, use us, Lord. So use me how you want to, God. Have your throne within my heart. I hear of the Lord wants you to know today that if you're here this morning and you would say I'm disqualified because of my story and my past and everything that's in my life that I bring into this service today he would not want me he would not want to use me the spirit of the Lord wants you to know today that you're exactly the person that Jesus died for no sin is too great no failure is too big that we can't bring it to the cross and have the wonderful awesome matchless blood of Jesus cover and wash away every sin and every transgression and every stain don't allow the enemy to tell you that your past is too big that your sin is too great that your failure is too Large for our awesome and great and mighty God. Jesus, we thank you today. Thank you for your presence that's in this place. Thank you for how you're ministering to hearts right now. Thank you that in our broken state, in our sinful state, in our inconsistencies and our ups and downs, you still love us. And while we were yet sinners, you died for us. You pursued us when we were a long way from home. You were standing on the front porch waiting for us to come back. And we thank you, Lord, today for those who are coming back. We thank you, Lord, for those we've been praying for who are coming back. We thank you for those today who feel a long way off, but this morning something is has tipped the scales of hope in their hearts today and they sense something fresh and new that they've not sensed in a while. Holy Spirit, draw us near to you. Draw us close to you. Give us that hope and that knowledge of your love and your grace today. Thank you. Thank you for what we've been able to celebrate. Thank you for what we've been able to declare and worship and praise today. And Lord, we make ourselves available to the preached word today that it'll go forth with power and anointing. It'll find good soil and produce an amazing harvest for the glory of your name. And everybody said, amen, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. If you have your Bible or something with your Bible on it, let's go to the second chapter of the first book. Let's go to Genesis chapter two today. Genesis chapter two, if you have the YouVersion Bible app, you can open it up and the points in the scriptures are there every Sunday. You just go bottom right hand corner, hit more, it'll open up a tab, you find events, you hit that and you can find the points in the scriptures of everything that we're gonna talk about today are right there and you can have them to, to kind of keep as you go. So this morning, uh, just a couple of things. If you're new to our church family, you're wondering how do I get involved? Uh, what does this church believe? How can I serve? What are you guys all about? Well, then the growth track is the place for you. 
It meets every Sunday at nine o'clock over in the Life Center. So you can go to Growth Track at nine, come to church at 11. So all you 11 o'clockers, that just works out just right for you. And uh, a new session month started uh, today. Uh, you can jump in next week with week two at nine o'clock. So uh, I hope you'll do that. I also want to let you know that tomorrow night is First Monday Prayer. We start the first Monday of every month having prayer here in the worship center from 6.30 to 7.30. It's just the room's open. There's prayer guides as you walk in. And it's just a time when we can come together and spend time in the presence of the Lord. So today we're continuing and actually completing a four-week message series we've been in called The Vow. And in this series, we're speaking to people who aren't married and trying to help them uh, be able to build a foundation for a marriage that will go the distance. And we're talking to those of us who are married and uh, just giving you some tools to put in your toolbox to help you, your marriage be as strong and as healthy as it possibly can be. When we look around today, we see that marriages are struggling. The stats say about 50% of marriages don't make it. That's not acceptable to us. It's not acceptable to God. It's not what God wants for our marriages. He wants something more and something better. And that's what we're doing in this series. And uh, I'm excited today to be able to finish this up. This has been a fun series. And uh, I hope we've learned a lot, found a lot of things that we can apply. And so let's finish today where we've been throughout the whole series in Genesis chapter 2. Verse 20, it says, But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. And today we add a verse that we've not looked at throughout this series, and it's this one, verse 25. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Father, we ask you to give your blessing to the preached word today. We pray that the word today would challenge us, convict us, and change us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's begin this morning with a couple of questions. Where are all the married people today? Raise your hand. Let me see you. All the married people. There's a whole bunch of us here this morning, hands down. Not married. Hope to be married one day. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Hold them up. Hold them up. Hold them up. Look around. Look around. Look around. Find you somebody. Pick you out somebody. <laughs> you, you might have a love connection right here in this room. You just, you just never know. You never know. Some of y'all met your spouse in church. Let me ask you another question. For those of you who are married or want to be married one day, how many of you, once you get married, or if you're married, you plan on committing adultery at some point in time in your marriage? Any hands there? Okay, all right. Uh, anybody plan on getting addicted to pornography in your, in your life ahead? Anybody, anybody, anybody? Anybody who would say, uh, well, I, I'm not going to do either of those. I wouldn't have a, a, a physical affair with somebody, but I might give my heart away and have an emotional affair with a neighbor, coworker, friend, or somebody like that. Anybody, any hands? Interesting, no hands went up on those questions. The reason why is because nobody plans to significantly wound their marriage with sin, yet people do it every single day. For those of you who are not married, it, it may seem like, okay, it really doesn't matter. For some of you, maybe you've been 
hanging out. I told somebody here Wednesday night, a single person who's here all the time, I said, thank you for hanging in on the marriage series. I know it's not been exactly for you, but really it has been because all of you single people, what we're trying to do is help you to be able to build a foundation to have a marriage that lasts because some of you know that you didn't build your foundation in the right way and now you're having to do some work, right? I won't ask you to say amen on that, but What I want you to know today, all of us to know, is that it all matters. Sin always matters. And look at this big idea for today. If you're married or unmarried, it's difficult to build a life of righteousness on a foundation of sin. The way you live today impacts the way you live in the future and what you want to build for your future. So today, we're going to talk about the vow of purity. Each week we've been looking at a different vow. We began week one with the vow of priority. And this is what we said in the vow of priority. God is your one and your spouse is your two. There was a vow in week one specifically for unmarried people and it went like this. I will seek the one while preparing for my two. And for all the married people, your vow went like this. I promise that God will be my first priority and my spouse will be my second, the vow of priority. Week two, we looked at the vow of pursuit. And this is what we said this, that week. We said, I promise to always pursue my two. God's my one, my spouse is my two, and I promise to always pursue my two. And then last week, we looked at the vow of partnership and it went like this. I promise our marriage will be about we and not about me. Today we conclude with the vow of uh, purity. And uh, the vow of purity sounds like this. I promise to confide in you and not hide from you. Everybody in the room together, married and unmarried and everybody in between, let's say this together. I promise to confide in you and not hide in you. Why? Because secrecy is the enemy of intimacy. Don't miss that. Secrecy is the enemy of intimacy. The vow of purity comes from Genesis chapter two where we've been parked throughout this whole series. And uh, as I noted a moment ago, we're we're adding a verse that we've not looked at yet because it's key to where we're going today. The scripture says in verse 24, that is why a man leaves his father and mother and they become one flesh. And then we have this verse that seems really almost out of place. It says, Adam and his wife were both naked And they felt what? No shame. The word shame right there is a Hebrew word. And that word is bush. Everybody say bush. Bush. You got it. And that word means to cause disgrace, to feel completely worthless, to be ashamed. So you could say Adam and Eve were both naked and they felt no disgrace. They felt no shame. Nothing was wrong, inappropriate, funny, or dirty they were walking around naked and they didn't even know what was going on. And, and, and we, we can't really even wrap our brain around how that would even make sense. But if you think about it like this, if you have little kids, if you ever had little kids in the house, especially if you had multiple kids, it was always that kid who liked to be naked. They come home, they rip off the diaper, the clothes, and they just run around two or three years old naked. You know, you got, and some of you were that naked kid. Praise God, you got saved and put some clothes on. But um, <laughs> we're thankful for that. But you don't think about that when a kid is little because it's cute and it's innocent. There's nothing shameful about it. And that's how it was with Adam and Eve. Here they are in the garden, they're naked. There's no shame, but we know what happened. A serpent comes along, tempts Eve. Adam's right there. He does not get off the hook because Paul tells us in Romans that all Adam, all sin came through Adam. So Adam's right there. He, he's biting the fruit just as much as Eve is. He doesn't stop it. He doesn't step in and uh, sin enters the world and they feel shame and self-conscious. And look what happens after that moment. The eyes of both of them were opened And then they realized they were naked. So there's a word now in their dictionary that they didn't even know before. They didn't even use the word naked, but now, you know, you talk about naked and afraid. Here was the first episode of naked and afraid. It's right there. They were naked, so they sewed leaves together and they made coverings for themselves. When sin enters the world as it did here, so does shame. Don't miss that today. When sin enters the world, so does shame. 
When we sin, we feel shameful. We feel unworthy. We feel unlovable. We feel dirty. We feel embarrassed. And we feel like we need to do what they did, which is hide. They were naked and afraid of what? We should see, say they were naked and afraid of who? Because we learn in the next verse who they were naked and afraid of. It said, the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. So this must have just been a normal thing for God to show up and walk with them and spend time with them. And, and they knew it was gonna happen. It wasn't like he showed up and they didn't understand or it was the first time. They knew he was coming. They knew the appointment time. And so the scripture said they did what? They hid. Sin brings shame and causes us to what? Hide. They hid from the Lord among the trees in the garden. So here's Adam and Eve. They put coverings on, but they're still, they're, something's not right. They know what they've done. They're hiding in the bushes. And here comes God walking. He's saying, Man, they're late, you know. Hey, Adam, Eve, where are you guys at? It's time. Hey, come to hang out and talk and just spend some time together. God's looking for them and and look at what the next scripture says. In the bushes, Adam and Eve are there. The bushes are shaking. And he says, I heard you, Lord, in the garden. And I was, what? Afraid because I was naked. So I hid. It's what happens, you know, going back to the illustration with a little kid. You've all had that kid in the house who runs through and they got chocolate all over their mouth. And you're like, you got into candy, right? You told you no candy for dinner, but you found the candy. Uh-uh, I, I didn't do anything, you know? And we do the same thing as adults. You know, somebody says, hey man, how you doing? Everything going all right? Good, man, things are going well. Anything you need to share? Anything I can pray with you about? Anything I need to hold you accountable about? I'm good, man, everything's good. Because when sin comes, so does shame. And we end up hiding when there's sin in our lives because we feel such a profound sense of shame. And that comes with a purpose because there's an enemy behind all of that. See, Satan didn't just want to bring sin into, world, into the world in that moment. Look what sin did. Don't miss this. Sin disconnected them from that relationship with God. And now instead of spending time with God, they're hiding from God. Does that sound like anybody in the room besides me? That when I sin and I disobey God, my natural tendency is to recoil and go away from God, not to run to God, right? Anybody else with me today? Satan's tool is to attach the act to the identity when it comes to shame. That's what Satan does. He attaches the act to the identity. So he says, watch this, you did something bad, therefore you are bad. Are we seeing this? You did something bad, so you are bad. He attaches the act to the identity. And we bring that into our marriages and then it, it kind of goes like this. I can't let you know what I did or what I'm going through because then you may think, bad of me or less of me. I can't let you know where I struggle because then it's gonna break the, the connection that we have and we don't have the trust that we need because we don't have the openness and honesty that we need. And instead of intimacy coming through truth, we live in secrecy so often in marriage, but that's not our vow for the day. Our vow says this, I promise to confide in you, not to hide from you because secrecy is the enemy of intimacy. Now let's think about that word secrecy for a moment. Do you associate that word more with light or darkness? That's an easy answer, it's what? Darkness. Secrecy is connected to darkness. In fact, in Ephesians chapter five, verse eight, Paul comes along and says something about this balance between light and dark and he says it like this. He said, for you were once darkness. And he's using what tense here? Pass, that's an easy, easy one. Even if you didn't do it in English, you can get that. For you once used to be in darkness, but now you are what? light in the Lord. For those of you who are Jesus followers today, before you were Jesus followers, you were in darkness. You were separated from God. You were in your sin. And the problem is though, that even as Christ followers, sometimes spiritually we may be forgiven, but practically we step back 
into sin. Am I talking to anybody today? Practically, we're forgiven. We, we, we've asked Christ to follow, uh, we've asked Christ to come into our lives and we're following him, but we find ourselves in one way or another stepping back into the darkness. It's kind of like when you go to the movie theater, you walk in, everything's well lit. They want you to know, they want you to know that you're about to drop $24 on two large Cokes and a popcorn. That's that probably cost, you know, a, you know, buck 50 in, in real time, right? Room's well lit up, but then you walk into the, the movie theater room and it, it's, it's much darker. Now we have assigned seats, which I like, but I, I can't tell where I'm at. I'm at that age, pull my phone out, looking around, making sure everybody gets in the right seat. And it's still dark, but after a few minutes, what happens? Your eyes do what? Your eyes adjust to the darkness. And then the opposite happens. If you ever taken the closest exit door once you walk out of the theater and, and, and you know, then you're singing the song, blinded by the light, you know, and it's totally different. But what has happened? You, your eyes got adjusted to the darkness. And for some of you here today, that's where you're at. You're a Christ follower. You're seeking God. You, you have been on that path, but you've stepped back into some darkness in your life and now your eyes are adjusted to the darkness and you don't realize how dark things really are. And sometimes in your marriage, you don't realize that things aren't working because you've adjusted to the darkness. And Paul comes along and he says this, for you were once darkness. Okay, this is in your what? Past, okay? But now you're to live as what? Light. And light has a way of producing certain things. He says, okay, if you're living as a child of light, there's gonna be fruit to that. And he lists three things. He says, there's gonna be goodness, righteousness, and truth. What's the opposite of truth? When there are lies, what do you do? Hide, okay, secrecy. So when you're living in the light as he is in the light, goodness, righteousness, and truth, and then he goes on to say this. He says, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness. So if you're in the light, your life will have fruit. But if you're stepping back into the darkness, he says your life will be fruit what? Fruitless. Do, do you see that this morning? And so today we have to come with this understanding that um, he says don't have anything to do with those, those things of darkness because it sends you in the dark and you will never find healing in the dark. Shame grows in the dark. Healing happens in the light. Have nothing to do with those deeds of darkness, but expose them. So the question I have to ask us this morning is, as, as Jesus-loving Christ followers, how do our eyes get adjusted and we wind up back in some of those old behaviors and old ways and old patterns of thinking? How does that happen? It's because we've got the sin line in the wrong place. So let's talk to, to the married people today. Well, unmarried, all of us. If we'd say the sin line, scripture is very clear about it, is, is the line of adultery. Let's say that line is right here, adultery. Okay, so I've gotten married and here's the sin line, and I know I can't pass this line because this is the line where I'm not faithful to my spouse anymore, but I'm with somebody else, emotionally or sexually. That's the sin line. But how many of you know that there are a whole lot of other sins that I have to push past and blow through before I get to that line right there? See, nobody wakes up and their marriage is even okay and on a Monday morning says, you know what, this afternoon, I'm gonna meet that gal that I work with or my neighbor or my friend or somebody that I've you know, kind of been talking to online and we're gonna meet down at Port Wentworth at the, at the Holiday Inn and, and we're gonna start an affair. It doesn't start that way. It starts because slowly we blow through sinful actions on our way to get to what some of us think, well, this is really the line, is I, I shouldn't commit adultery. Shouldn't have sex with anybody other than my spouse. And if I'm not married, I don't have sex with anybody until I'm married. And that's the line. And really, that's it. Just that line. But what? The reason why we find ourselves in the darkness is because we don't really understand where the true line of sin is. And maybe instead of looking at it like lines, we should look at it like, like a bar. 
You know, you, you guys all know that term, raising the what? Raising the bar. So, you I mean, you, you, look at, um, you look at a company like, I'm hungry, so I guess I'm talking about it. It's probably the wrong time to talk about it on today. But you look at somebody like Chick-fil-A, they totally, I ain't talked about Chick-fil-A in a long time. I used to preach about it every Sunday. <clears throat> but they got here and they're kind of meeting my need. But, um, you know, <laughs> um, we talk about Chick-fil-A and we know they raise the bar when it comes to, I mean, there's nobody else. I, I, just a side note, why doesn't ever anybody else cheat off their paper? Yeah, can y'all not get this right? Somebody's doing it perfectly. I'm just getting it out. I'm on the couch. Y'all come sit on my couch. I'm sitting on yours right now, okay? But Chick-fil-A raised the bar, right? With how fast food can be done. We know how it can be done. So what we need to understand is really we've set the line over here. But for me to get past that adultery line, I've blown through a whole lot of other things. So really what I've got to come to the understanding is where's the bar that scripture has set. Well, we all know Ephesians, I'm sorry, Exodus 20, 14. It's one of God's top 10. It's the first level on the bar. And, uh, and it says, do not commit adultery. It's, um, it, it's in the top 10, right? It's number seven. You shall not commit adultery, okay? That's, and, and, and some of you are looking at the, the illustration this morning, you're thinking, that's way too low, Pastor. I mean, that, that's a pretty big one because I know how the people are in my family. I know how the people are that I work with. And Pastor, you know, that, that should be a little bit higher. Uh, I, I'm gonna tell you it shouldn't be higher because Exodus 20, 14 is the minimal requirements that God's word gives us when it comes to purity. This is the minimal we're called to is to save sex between one man and one woman for life in the confines of marriage. You shall not commit adultery. But we think that we've set the bar high. Well, Pastor, that should be higher because I see what everybody else is doing and Pastor, they don't even have a bar or an illustration or nothing. They're just doing their thing. Well, at least I'm doing this. Well, if I'm a Christ follower, at least doesn't cut it. So, Scripture comes along, tells us you shall not commit adultery. That's, that's level one. Level two, we get to the book of Proverbs. And Solomon comes along. He's trying to give his son some, uh, some instructions. And so it's gonna come from a father to a son, but this, this could come from a mother to a daughter, a father to a daughter. It's not just a, 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 a thing for men. Level two says, keep far from her. Keep far from him. Keep far from her. Who? Well, in Proverbs 5, 8, Solomon warns us of what he calls the adulterous woman. He says, keep a path far from her. Do not go near the door of her house in Proverbs chapter 5, verse 8. And he describes this woman who's out there to try to you know, lure men in. And then in chapter 7, he takes it even further and he tells this story. Proverbs chapter seven, and, and every young man, every man here in the room, everybody in the room should go home and read Proverbs seven today. Because he tells a story, he says, I was, I was looking out the window one day, and he said, I saw this, uh, this group of guys hanging out, and I saw one in particular who was super naive. And all the other kind of guys went down the street, but he was kind of hanging out by the door of this house, and this woman came out. He calls her the adulterous woman or the promiscuous woman. And she came out of the house, and she said to him, she said, hey, pal, it's your lucky day. I got my best clothes on. I got makeup on. I'm looking just right, smelling just right. Got brand new sheets on the bed from Egypt. The place is, smells great with, uh, with perfumes. I, there's rose petals on the bed. There's, there's music playing. It's your lucky day. I want you to come in, pal. I'm about to rock your world. And I'm going to rock your world all night long. Y'all are looking at each other like you never read Proverbs chapter seven. That's exactly what it says. <laughs> You're gonna experience something you've never experienced before. And he's looking at her hand and he sees that ring and she said, ah, don't worry about that, he's gone. He left this morning, took a bag full of money with him. So I know he's gonna be gone a long time. So you come on in here, boy. And Solomon said, I watched as this young man was, his, his example, he said, she used persuasive words and smooth talk, and he was like an ox going to slaughter. Wow, that's an illustration. Like an ox going to the slaughter. 
And then Solomon says, son, listen, there's, there's women out there like that. There's men out there like that. He says, listen to me, my sons, pay attention to my words. Don't let your heart stray toward her. Don't wander down her wayward path, for she's been the ruin of what? Many. Many men have been her victims. Many women have been his victims. Her house is the road to the grave. Her bedroom is the den of death. It looks good, it smells good, it's gonna feel good, but in the end, you're gonna die. And, 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 I, and I gotta tell you, you know, I, I've never been in a place in my life, John, where I was walking down the road or in a city or in a situation and being approached by the adulterous woman. Never had that happen, Russell. I mean, she's never come out the door and been like, hey, Les, come on, man, got it all ready for you. I've never had that happen. And I'd say most of y'all here in this room, you've never had that happen before either. But I'd say you have been sitting there in front of the TV scrolling and you stop scrolling. Or you're on your phone and we could park here and just preach for hours, right? Because now the way the algorithm, algorithms, that's a tough word for me, the algorithms are set up is that it sends it to you. You don't have to go looking for it, it'll send it to you. I've told this story before, several years ago, I was preaching a series in 2019, I think, on temptation. It was in the summer. My wonderful wife was, was searching for bathing suits. Because it's summer, you know? I get back to the office, I'm, this is no lie, I can't exaggerate, this is exactly what happened. I am on BibleGateway.com, where I do a lot of research, and I'm researching and on a series to preach to y'all on temptation. And right there is bathing suits showing up in the sidebar. I'm like, God, I mean, I'm trying, Lord. I'm trying to preach. I'm trying to do the right thing. I'm on BibleGateway.com. And the promiscuous woman is showing up in those bathing suits. Remove that ad. I took a picture of it and sent it to one of my buddies who a pastor. I said, man, the devil was a liar. He's going to come after you one way or another. I know we're laughing about it, but you gotta be careful, guys, girls, everybody. You, I'm not telling you anything you don't need to know because if you're on social media at all, you know it comes after you. So if, we're not talking about the adulterous woman, that, that random thing that's gonna happen. We're talking about the porn in your pocket that you carry around every day. It's right there, and you have to be careful. We're talking about the, the search bar. We're talking about TikTok. We're talking about Snapchat. We're talking about Instagram. We're talking about whatever it is and however it is it shows up in your life. Ladies, for you, it might be, if some of y'all still watch soap operas or read romance novels or watch movies like Fifty Shades of Grey or crap and trash like Game of Thrones, why in the world would you put yourself in front of that garbage all of those examples can be, and some of them are, a house, a road to the grave. So if, if that app that you've got, it's not worth your soul to hang on to that app if it keeps sending you deeper and deeper into hell and sin. Pick up the stinking phone and call somebody and talk to them. Don't, you don't have to have a chat that's gonna be gone in a minute. I sound 52 today. My Lord, I sound old. But if you want to save your soul, you'll do whatever it takes. The scripture says, put the, put the description of this level again. Oh, I didn't even raise the bar up, y'all. I'm preaching so hard, I forgot about my illustration. I raised the bar up, and I'm to keep where? Keep how? Far from her, far from him. Do not go near the door to that house. I do everything I can to keep space between me and that thing. Are we okay? Level one, level two, okay, New Testament. Boy, here he comes. Sermon on the Mount. You think Jesus raised the bar? Oh. Matthew chapter five, Jesus says, you've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. You heard about level one is exactly what he's saying. Exodus 20, 14, you've heard that, but I'm gonna tell you something different. I'm gonna tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart and he's already gone over the, the sin line. It's not just for men with women, it's women with men, so you fill in the blank, whatever your gender is and how it fits today. 
Jesus says, what I'm after is not the act way down here on the line or way here on level one that we've, we've kind of staked. Out. Well, I'm not doing the act. Jesus says, I'm looking for something more important. I'm, I'm, I'm talking to you about your thought life, and where your eyes go. And then he says, listen, if your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than your whole body to be thrown in hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than your whole body to go into hell. Well, side note, this really kind of trashes the whole deal that Jesus just had a message of love and he never talked about anything but love. No, people don't know the word who say stuff like that. Jesus is not saying that we should mutilate our bodies. Okay? If it was the case, then we took 16 men a couple of weeks ago to a men's conference in, uh, in Birmingham, and there were 1,600 men there, and if that would mean that we should have walked in the room and there would have been 1,600 one-armed cyclopses in the room. <laughs> what is Jesus saying? Okay? He said, if there's something that gets in the way of righteousness in your life, rid yourself of it. Stay away from it. Don't flirt with it. Don't get close to it. It's poisonous. It's impurity. It's not cute. It's not okay. It's wrong. It's dangerous. Stay away from it. He takes what Solomon said and he bumps it up to the next level. It echoes the words of Job in Job 31, verse one, when he said, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look at lust, look with lust at a young woman. Men, only we know, our, our wives and, and females don't know, their brains aren't wired the way ours are. And I've said before, if I probably shouldn't say this, but I'm just being honest today. If women really knew how our brains and minds worked, they'd probably all leave us here and go somewhere else and just have a big women's retreat until Jesus came back. <laughs> There's a reason why a lot of this is geared toward men because we're just made differently. And uh, I don't know how you guys are, but this is, this is covenant I, I need to make every day. Not like one time I made it and I'm good. Every day, especially this time of year, it's getting warmer. I mean, just at Kroger, I'm just trying to buy groceries and <laughs> half-naked women walking around. All right, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look with lust. Okay, y'all okay? Y'all yeah. still gonna let me be your pastor? Yeah. Yeah, I ain't done yet. Wait, I finish the sermon. <laughs> Do not commit adultery. Keep far from her. Do not look lustfully. Can the bar be raised any higher than the words of Jesus? Well, Paul comes along in Ephesians chapter five and he's living in a, in a culture much like ours that is a sexually charged culture everywhere you go. And this is what he says. He says, we're gonna raise the bar even higher. And he says, I, level four is live as light. We talked about that a moment ago, light and darkness. And he says, live as children of what? Okay, and then he says this. He says, listen, there shouldn't be obscenity or foolish talk or coarse joking which are out of place for people who are living in the... Light, okay? So let's talk about this for a moment. It's not just what I do physically. It's not just where I go, level two. It's not just my eyes, level three. It's my mouth, level four. It's the things that I say. It's the conversations that I have. It's the jokes that I tell. It's unfortunate sometimes, and I've been there many times, that sometimes Christian guys can be the most crass and rude. Because in some reason we think that, well, it's just the Christian guys, you know, we all know what we're doing. We're all trying to do this together, but we still be as rude and crass as the people sitting on the other side of the lunch table. We just don't drop the F-bombs that they do. And Paul says, listen, if you are going to live in the what? In the what? Then you got to walk different. You got to be different. You got to talk different. No obscenity, foolish talk, coarse joking. This is where those other things come in place that, that men, the women that you're around in your neighborhood and on your job and, and people that you're surrounded with, women, the men that you're around, the, the line is not way over here. It's all these other things that I'm not saying inappropriate things to the opposite sex that will make them feel uncomfortable that I am honoring the opposite sex and lifting them up and people wouldn't think that I'm, I'm weird or strange or something. 
Because the emotional affairs start long before the physical affair. My goal, this is, we're talking about raising the bar of what? Of what? So it's the top of the screen. You're going to wake at 11 o'clock. My goodness, I can't make it any bigger. Raising the bar of what? Purity. The objection is not just to stay out of the bed with everybody else and not just to stay away and not just to keep my eyes, but it's my mouth. I'm raising the bar of purity. I'm, I'm living in the light. And then Paul even raises it one more step higher in this same passage. He says, guys, let's just put it like this. He says, uh, let's see if your short pastor can make it up here. He says, uh, not a hint. Oh, wow. That, that's a game changer, ain't it? Pastor, you gonna have the church open every single day for me to come by here and pray? Uh, I guess if you need to, but among you there must not be even a what? Hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity. What's impurity? Impurity is poison. What do you do around poison? You stay away from it. Anything that's impure, displeasing to God, you stay away from it because it corrupts and it harms and it poisons those who consume it. Here's essentially what we're after in this message today is this big thought right here. Sin is a big deal when you realize where scripture sets the bar. And the problem is so often we are just measuring ourselves by the world around us and not the word in front of us. I did this. I did this for, for a long time in my life. Now I know that you look at me and you think, when you look at your pastor you hear him preach, you immediately think five star, three sport, all star state athlete. Wow, somebody laughed really, really, <laughs> really big before I even finished my joke. I was not that guy, obviously. I was the guy who was in band. I was the guy who was in chorus. I was the guy who was in theater. My brain works another way. But I always have loved sports. I've always enjoyed watching sports. If I'd have been bigger, stronger, faster, not as white, I probably would have done something else. <laughs> but I've always enjoyed sports. And even as a kid um, and as a teenager, back in the day, some of you are old enough to remember how cool it was to, have, um, to get Sports Illustrated at your house. It was a big deal, and it's not now. I mean, Sports Illustrated's about to be toppled. I heard a story a few weeks ago. They may not even make it, but it was a big deal back in the day to get Sports Illustrated. You get it every week at your house, and if you were a sports person, what you were hoping for is that some, your favorite team or your favorite athlete would be on the cover, and if they were, you'd keep those. I remember keeping some of those for years, man. I wish I still had them. They probably were worth some money. And I, man, I love Sports Illustrated, best picture sports action pictures ever, amazing shots. I didn't read a lot of the articles, but just amazing shots. But when I was about 13 or 14 years old, I became aware there was another edition of Sports Illustrated that came out once a year, the swimsuit edition. That cover's a little bit different than the other covers. And um, I remember knowing when it would come in the mail and it didn't show up. I kept looking for it. So I asked my dad one time, I said, hey, where's that, uh, where's that Sports Seal Trade Swimsuit Edition? He said, I took it where it needed to go, out of the mailbox and I burned it in the trash barrel. <laughs> What's up, man? It's for Sports <laughs> Illustrated. And my dad, my dad knew when it was coming. My dad's a barber, was a barber, is a barber, still a barber, classic barber shop. He's been in the same spot for over 55 years. He'll turn 80 this summer, he's still cutting hair. So my dad had Sports Illustrated in his barber shop, and he knew when it came when the when the uh, when the swimsuit edition would come in, and he'd grab it and throw it away. And the men, he said, the men would come in the shop to him and they say, "Hey, Roy, where's that Sports Illustrated swimsuit edition at?" And he'd say, "In the trash where it should be." Man, I'm thankful for my dad, who was a man of integrity, who lived like that, didn't just say it but lived that way. But I wasn't living that way. I was a Jesus follower. I was trying to do the right thing. I was trying to follow Jesus. And, but my bar was here. I had made the decision I wouldn't have sex before marriage, but I wasn't really concerned or convicted about getting that Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Edition. So no lie, you're not ashamed. I, mean, I am ashamed to say it, but, but I had a goal. I had a goal that the next year I was gonna beat my dad in a mailbox. And I did. For three years, I beat him to the mailbox. 
Do you think those three years worth of Sports Illustrated swimsuit editions that I got, do you think I kept them on the nightstand behind, beside my bed? Where do you think I put them? In the bottom of a drawer. Somebody like, under your mattress. <laughs> That's where yours were. Mine was, <laughs> mine, was, mine was in a drawer underneath a lot of other stuff. And every now and then, 13, 14, 15-year-old Les would take it out and just, whoo, hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God for his creation. However, I got away with it, you know. And here's how I got away with it. For me, going to church, youth group, the whole year, here's how I got away with it. Because I had a standard that was set right here, and I knew what I wasn't going to do. I knew what everybody else was doing around me. And I wasn't sleeping with everybody else around me or doing the things that they were doing. So I thought I was okay. Y'all, my bar was way too low and I was walking and living in sin because I had that tucked away. Anything I had to tuck away and hide is sin because that word we just talked about, shame. So the bar was not set high in my life at all. It wasn't until sometime later that I really realized how high the bar was set when it came to sexual purity. That it wasn't just about saying no to all this other stuff till you can make it to the finish line of your wedding night. It's about purity. That's what we're after. I appreciate so much what uh, the youth movement, Pastor Kevin and Miss Renee, they've been pouring into these students the last few weeks saying the very same things that we're saying today, right guys? It's not just about checking those boxes, it's about purity. That's what our goal should be, is not just that I'm not you know, doing what everybody else is doing, because if you're measuring yourself by everybody else, there's always somebody else who's doing worse than you are, right? There's always a girl who's much more looser than you are. There's always a guy who's doing much more than you are. Your measuring stick is not the person across the lunch room from you or in your class or on your sports team, your measuring stick is the word of God. And it's the same true for all of us because all of us work and are around people who are far from God. And if we're not careful, we'll measure ourselves by everybody else. We'll measure ourselves, as I said a moment ago, by the world and not the word. So the word comes along, sets the bar high. And honestly, I mean, I look at that bar, not a hint. And I'm like, in this world, is that even possible? Not a hint. It's not possible within my own power. That's the point. I can't live up to that on less his power. I have to be here. Look at what Paul says. Paul gives us so much good things about this. He says, here's the difference. I say, if you wanna live with the bar high, walk by the Spirit. Because shoving magazines in the bottom of a drawer is walking in the flesh. Scrolling, 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 scrolling is walking in the flesh. Having no reins on my eyes, my ears, my spirit, the things I'm watching is walking in the flesh. And Paul says this, if I walk in the spirit, I won't gratify that part of me that wants to run after all that. I don't know about how y'all are, but I've told you, I'm gonna be honest, this might be the last day I preach. They may meet at one o'clock today and fire me because I was too honest. But I don't know about y'all, but when I got saved, the old man didn't just stay there. He still hangs around. Yeah. He still comes back and wants to put my attention on something else. Yeah. But Paul says, walk by the Spirit. Three things that we've gotta do. The scripture says, to live a life of purity, number one, we must confess and repent. That's where it starts. First John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. What does confess mean? Confess means I acknowledge, I agree, and I admit. To confess is a declaration of truth. Some of you, when this service is over in just a few minutes, when we call you to prayer, you're gonna need to move into a time of confession. And what that means is you admit and you declare that what you are doing is sin. And the scripture says when we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all that garbage in our life. Somebody say hallelujah, that's good news. <laughs> confess and what? Repent. 
Too often we've taken both of those words and we've married them and we think they mean the same thing. They do not mean the same thing. Confession is just the beginning. Repentance means this. Paul, uh, Peter, rather, on the day of Pentecost said, repent and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sin. So forgiveness of sin doesn't just happen with confession, it happens with repentance. And repentance is completely different. Confession, I acknowledge, I agree, I admit. Repent means I change the elements of my life, my attitude, my thought, and my behavior. I do a 180. When I repent, I go in a different direction than when I, where I was going. Confess and repent. Here's the second thing I've gotta do. I gotta seek and hide. Oh, wait a minute, I got that wrong. That should be hide and seek. No, it's seek first and then hide. We've been talking about the wrong kind of hiding today, the, the kind of hiding that shame causes us to hide those things. But there's a different thing that we should be hiding according to Psalm 119. It says, how can a young person stay on the path of purity? How can these young people in this world that we're living in today with access to everything that the world puts in front of them, and it's not just them, it's us too, right? How can we stay on this path of purity that we're being talked about this morning? By living according to your word. Seek and hide. I seek you with all my heart. This is what you're doing on a Sunday morning at 11 o'clock, being in the presence of God, singing, worshiping, hearing the word of God. You're seeking God with all your heart. Don't let me stray from your commands. And then he says, I don't just seek you, but I've done what? I've hidden. You want to hide something, hide God's word. Hide God's word in your heart. And when you hide God's word in your heart, it empowers you to do what? Not sin. When God's word is in your heart, something transformative happens inside of you. For God's word to do its work, we have to know his word. We have to be people and students of his word. It can't be something we just hear at church. It's gotta be the living daily bread. If you're not in God's word every day, you're not in God's word enough. If all you're doing is getting the U version verse of the day and you're getting 15 seconds of the word, that's not enough. It's not enough for me. And I know it's not enough for you because the world comes at us wide open so much more than that. I heard a study a few years ago about a study that was done about this very thing. And I want you to watch this three minute video that talks about the power of the word in our lives. Check this out. So there's another study that came out and this is one that I, I actually start most of my teachings when I'm at conferences because I, I think it really sets a precedent and it's an encouragement. Um, there was a recent study by the Center for Bible Engagement where they pulled 40,000 uh, uh, general population in the US from eight to 80. And they just wanted to see how we are engaging with scripture. Right. And they discovered something that actually became kind of the profound discovery of the entire study. It, they weren't even looking for this and this is kind of became the highlight of the study. Right. Um, when we're in the scripture one time a week, and that could be church on Sunday, that's pastor saying you open your Bible, we hear the message, one time a week had negligible effect on some key areas of your life. So I'll, I'm gonna spell that out more here in a moment. Two times a week, negligible effect. Now at three times a week, there was a blip on the map. Like there was a heartbeat. Something happened, again, a heartbeat. Okay. But here was the profound discovery. When we're in the scripture four times a week, it literally spikes off the chart. You would expect that it'd be one, two, th I mean, there'd be a gradual incline right. on the effect and impact that would have in your life, but it was literally one, two, three, four, something radically happens. Okay, you got my curiosity. To this what, extent. What kind of behavior is being affected? Feeling lonely drops 30%. Wow, Ang four times a week in the four Bible. Four times a week in the Bible. Okay. Anger issues drop 32%. Uh, bitterness in relationships, marriage, a relationship with your kids, and so on, drops 40%. Alcoholism drops 57%, feeling spiritually stagnant. You know, if there was one area when I'm talking with people that, that they'll be honest about is they just feel spiritually stagnant. Ask them the question, how much time are you spending in Scripture? If they're in the Scripture four times a week or more, it drops 60%. Wow. Viewing pornography drops 61%. That's very important. Now, on a flip positive side, sharing your faith wow. jumps 200%. Wow. Because you have a confidence in God's word. 
And then discipling others jumps 230%. That's, that's amazing right there. It, can, I, can I say, I have a friend who's a neuroscientist, right? And they did a study where they were actually able to trace what was going on in the mind from the, you know, the, the, the synapse connections and everything. They had people reading history books. They had people reading science books. They had people reading the Bible. They had people reading other religions books. The only one they saw significant change in, they had people reading novels all hooked up. The one that had the significant change was the one who was reading the Bible in their neural patterns because the Bible says this, don't be conformed to this world, but be, re but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That is with the Word of God. And the Bible, the Word never comes back void. Never, when you never read the Scripture, void. it yes. is God's Word. That's so amazing. Everybody say, wow. How many times a week? Four times a week. Why? Because the Word is living and active. It transforms our hearts. It conforms our minds to the minds of Christ. It washes, in, washes impurities away. It leads us to know the power of the Holy Spirit. If you want to know how to walk in the Spirit, add Bible reading to your daily habits, a part of what you do every day. We have a, a policy in this church that there, there's no excuses for not reading the Bible. I don't accept them. I do not accept men when you look at me and you say, I don't like to read. You read stuff that you are interested in. And if you're really interested in being free of pornography, I've just given you the answer. The stats back it up, start reading the word. It's unlike anything you've ever read before. Find a Bible that you can understand. Find a translation. If you need help with that, I would be glad to help you with that. Confess and repent. Seek and hide. And here's the last one. Submit and resist. So after you've done all this, this is what we finished with that last song with a while ago. Submit yourselves then to God and do what? resist the devil. That's action, okay? So what that says is I don't just stand here and be like, God, okay, all right, you do it. There's something I have to do. Once I submit, then I take that step in my life to resist the enemy in my life. I have uh, I've given several resources on the YouVersion Bible app today. If you're using that during the message, uh, you can scroll down and look, and there are resources on there today that I've given you that will send you to... Um, to uh, links for podcasts that are specifically designed to speak into your life if you're dealing with an addiction to pornography. Uh, resources like Covenant Eyes that are, that are um, things you can put on your computer and your phone to help you to beat pornography. Messages and all types of resources because the stats say that there are more people in this room who are struggling with pornography, men and women, than are not. What is the action step today? Don't just hear the word James says, don't just be hearers of the word, but be what? Doers. So I want to ask you, if you're dealing with this in your life today, what's the action step? There is a step you need to take when you leave this place to raise the bar of purity in your life. And one of the biggest things we've got to do, church, I've said it over and over, but one more time, we've got to stop comparing ourselves and our purity and our holiness to the world. We must compare ourselves to the word because the world's method isn't working. I said that last week. If you want what other people have, you got to do what other people won't do and don't do. Confess and repent, seek and hide, submit and resist. As someone comes and begins to play this morning, I, I want to close with this thought today. Um, a few years ago, I was, um, Monday morning, I was at a, at a mechanic here in, in Rinkin. I was getting my oil changed one Monday morning. And uh, I come in, I sit down, um, I, nobody else was in the little lobby of this, of this little mechanic. And um, I sit down and, and notice right in front of me, She's back. <laughs> On the top, guys. Nobody else was in there. New receptionist, didn't know me, didn't know I was a pastor. Looking around, nobody else is there. 
And there I am. The pastor of Rinkin Church of God. The man of God. I was like, that don't bother me one bit. I preached a word yesterday. I'm walking in the fire of God. Psst, whatever. I had a conversation with Les and I was like, oh, I haven't seen her in a while. There she is, the promiscuous woman. Nobody in there but me. Reception is kind of around the corner. It would have been real easy for me to just go on. How much has this thing changed in 30 years? Just thumb through. Thankfully, I was uh, walking in the Spirit. I just finished a message series on uh, Joseph. And I did. I reached down, Joseph from the Old Testament. I reached down and I picked the magazine up. I clicked the very top of that picture. I turned it over. I picked up the other magazines and I crammed it far underneath. And I sat back and I was like, I won that one. I got that one right. You know, the more times you say no, the stronger you get in the fight. And I, I posted this on social media that day, June the uh, 3rd, 2019. Just finishing a series on the life of Joseph. Talking about, we talked a lot about sexual purity in that series and how um, Exodus 39, 7 through 8 says, Potiphar's wife soon began to, to look at him lustfully. She said, come and sleep with me, she demanded, but Joseph refused. You know, looking at that magazine that day was, come and look at me. You ain't looked at one of these in a long time, buddy. Nobody else is here. Nobody's going to know. Come and look at me. But this is what I wrote on Facebook that day. I said, yesterday I finished up a message series on the life of Joseph. I talked a lot about the path of integrity Joseph chose to walk. Potiphar's wife didn't go after Joseph once, but multiple times. Joseph refused each time she made an offer. This morning, as I took a seat to wait on an oil change, there sits Potiphar's wife in the form of the Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Edition. No one else was in the room. The new receptionist doesn't know I'm a pastor or a Christ follower. It would have been easy to pick it up and thumb through it for a few minutes. So I did. I picked it up. I turned it upside down. And I shoved it in the bottom after taking this picture. Remaining on the path of integrity as Joseph did isn't about making the right choices, is about making the right choices one at a time. It's bouncing the eyes when an attractive person walks by. It's refusing to visit a website or follow someone's story that may lead you to sin. It's putting space between you and anything that compromises your integrity. It's turning the magazine upside down. In the book, A Purpose Driven Life, Rick Warren says, temptation only provides the choice. It's up to us as to what we'll do. Please listen to your pastor today. The biggest lie that the enemy tells us is that when we're tempted, that's it, you sinned. Temptation only provides the choice. The choice to do right or wrong. And this is where I finished up. I found that the more I make the right choice, the easier it is to stay on the path of integrity. When Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 10, 5, we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. Joseph did it and we can too. He simply refused. He refused to give the enemy any portion of his mind. And each time you refuse, you get stronger for the next time Miss Potiphar shows up for the next time the Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Edition is there. You insert whatever it is for you. You do not have to live in shame. You do not have to live in this addiction. You can be free. We just told you how to do it. Put those back up there, Chris. Confess and repent. Seek and hide. Submit 
and resist. Is it that easy, Pastor? It's not easy, but that's the answer. Uh, There's nothing else. I can tell you that's it. And so if we're going to stop hiding, if we're, not, if we're going to stop living in shame, if we're going to stop hiding in the bushes when God's calling us out to him, then we've got to raise the bar. And that means my standard is not the standard of the world, but the standard of the word. I don't compare myself with the guys I walk around high school, college with, the ladies I'm with at high school, college. I don't compare myself with the people I work with. I compare myself only to what this word has called me to. The only way I can live according to what this word has called me to is in a deep and daily and continual dependence upon the Holy Spirit who lives inside of me, who's the only one who gives me the power to pick up the magazine, turn it upside down. That's it. It's not because I'm a pastor. It's not because I know more about Scripture than you do. It's because the same Holy Spirit that lives inside of me lives inside of you. We have been called to be people of the light. Father, in this moment, I pray for my church. I pray for people who have lost hope, for men who are struggling, for marriages that are barely hanging on. And I pray today that they would sense, first of all, your love and your grace. Lord God, before we can get to that point where we confess and repent, we have to be aware of how much you love us and that the blood of Jesus washes away every sin and every stain. And there is no sin too great for you. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would speak to every person in this room who walked in today and didn't know this was the message that they were going to get, but it was the message that they needed and you're using it to speak to people right now and to bring their hearts to you. God, I pray that we as a church and we as men and women and young men and women of God would be people of purity. That we would confess and repent. We would seek and hide we would submit and resist and lean on and on the power of the Holy Spirit that we've been given to walk in freedom. Holy Spirit, I ask you to move right now and begin to transform hearts and lives. I feel your presence so strongly right now, God. And I believe you want to do something right now that is transformative, that will change the course of a couple's marriage or a person's life because of what you're speaking and doing right now. In the name of Jesus, I pray it. As the worship team comes in just a moment, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to ask you to stand in just a moment. And we're going to open up these altars today for prayer not for me to come by and pray with you but for you to just find a place to pray and kneel and listen I get it this is the most difficult message to come and pray if you need to pray because people in the room may say wow what's he dealing with what's she dealing with don't worry about that anybody who has half a heart says you know what I'm not going to be the guy who picks up the rock I'm going to be the guy who offers grace amen so we're opening up these altars in just a moment and if you need to come and pray and just walk through what we've talked about today confession repentance pastor I've, I've prayed about this brought this on and on and on I keep bringing this same thing to God 
my goodness, you're here this morning on a Sunday morning and you came in, in to intersect with this message, it tells you that God says today's the day that you're going to be free. Today, everything changes. And what they're going to begin to do, they're going to begin to sing a song this morning that communicates the grace and the love and the mercy of our awesome God. And if you want to come and find a place to pray, the altars are going to be open. If not, I want us to to declare this song of worship and praise to our good and gracious God who gives us the strength as we stand all over the room to walk it out, to walk in the Spirit. God, as we get ready to respond today, Lord, we pray and we hear your word calling us to something greater. We hear you calling us, Lord, to set the bar higher. And so today, Lord, we come into your presence and into this moment to lay it all at your feet and to run to the Father. I've carried a burden too long a mile I wasn't created to bear it I hear your invitation to let it all go, and I see it now, I'm laying it down, and I know that I need you, I run to the Father, fall into grace, I'm done with the hiding, no reason to wait, my heart Surging. My soul needs a friend, so I run to the Father again and again and again and again. Oh, oh. You saw my condition. Had a plan from the start. Son for redemption 
powerful, powerful song. Maybe the most powerful part of that song. Put that last line up there that Cody Carnes wrote in this is again and again and again. How many of you, that's your story? You ran again and again and again. Everybody in this room, your hands should be, could be up. That's all of our stories because he welcomes us back again and again and again. Lord, we thank you today. We celebrate your grace. We celebrate the space that you give us to come and confess. Now, Holy Spirit, give us the power to repent, to do the things that we need to do, to eliminate the things in front of us we need to eliminate, to submit and resist, to put the action behind it, and then daily to seek and hide, to stop hiding the sinful things in our lives, but replace those things that we're hiding with the Word of God. Lord, I speak freedom. We started the service singing freedom. I speak freedom in the name of Jesus over every life, over every mind, over every bondage that the enemy has today in anyone's life. May we walk out of here taking that first step of freedom, knowing that nothing is impossible with our good and awesome and great God. Lord, we've heard your word today. We've heard the call to set the bar high when it comes to purity. So Holy Spirit, we need you every day to do that. Give us strength, God. Give us the power to be able to walk with integrity, to walk with purity. And God, when we fail, to know we pick ourselves up and we do what we just sang again and again and again and again we run back to the loving graceful arms of our good God somebody give God praise tonight for his goodness his mercy his grace hallelujah thank you today thank you today God bless you we'll see you back Wednesday night have a great rest of your week